and then the middle, which is a mix between the two, some client, some server stuff. So we're going to start off by looking at the client solution, which will involve us creating a JAR file, J-A-R, which stands for Java Archive. All right. Now we'll talk about that step. We won't talk about like actually creating the install programs and all that because that's platform specific. That, you know, that, that's platform specific. At any rate, um, let's think about a couple things that we would want to do when we give someone um, our Java application. First thing that we would want to do is we would want to make sure that they get the compiled code and not the source code. All right? Unless we're talking about an open source application where we're giving away the source to, um, you know, the source is, is ours proprietarily, if that's a word, and we would want to keep it and we would want to not uh, make sure we distribute that. So we would want to give the compiled code as opposed to um, the source code. In fact, if, it's, if it is an open source uh, application, oftentimes, you know, sometimes if, if they want to be nice, they'll give you a compiled version. But a lot of times they're like, hey, here you go. Here's the source code. Have fun with it, you know. Uh, <laughs> and at any rate, uh, assuming we're not doing open source, we want to give the class files. And uh, it'd be nice if we could just give one file instead of having like 50 files, all right, uh, that we give it. Because you can imagine, um, we have, uh, we've been writing very small applications and if you think about it, I'm trying to think back uh, the last one that I've graded for some folks. Um, even a small application, we probably had 10 or so classes in the one. I'm thinking the schedule one, probably of that order. Can you imagine a, 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 you know, a larger application would, you know, would have much, many more than that. So we, it would be nice if we didn't have to give them so many of them where they could maybe like lose one of the files or whatever. So we want to put everything in one file and we want it to be the class files. And that's what a jar file is. Jar again sends for Java archive. Now, the other thing that we're going to do as far as this goes is we're going to organize our classes into packages. All right. We do this for a couple reasons. Um, if you can imagine at a large organization there might be, you know, different teams of people working on different applications. Ideally, the creation of classes uh, allows us to pop a component in anywhere we need it. So there shouldn't be duplication of effort, right? There should be, if there's a certain piece of functionality that calculates shipping rate, for example, then any application that needs to calculate shipping rate, regardless if that's like the home application for that piece of functionality or not, should be able to use that shipping class to do the calculation. Um, so you kind of want to organize them in little places that can be easily, more easily managed. And another reason that we want to organize them is there's a potential for there to be conflicts like in the name of a, uh, the, the name of a, uh, classes. For example, let's say we had a furniture store. All right. Now, they may have a table class to represent, you know, the things that are made out of wood. They have four legs, you know, that, that they sell uh, at this furniture store. They may also have a table class for a reporting system that queries a database. All right. Both classes called table. Both of them represent table. Well, how can you have two classes named table, especially if they're being worked on by different people at different time? Well, if, if they're in their own package, then you don't have that problem. All right? And if you think even that it's possible you could be integrating uh, applications even from you know, other divisions, other organizations, whatever, you know, it's a good idea to have things in their own class. Let's say you buy an application that gives you certain classes and you want to sort of latch your code onto it and use some of those classes. They may coincidentally use the same name for their classes as you have. How do you resolve that conflict? One of the ways that you resolve that conflict is by putting them in packages. So, how do you put, um, uh, how do you put something in a package and, and how do you name your packages? The naming scheme for packages is to use sort of, 
I don't know if this is the actual term for it, but it's the term I'm going to use. Sort of a reverse URL notation. All right? Because keep in mind, these package names are just names, right? It's not like it's running out to the internet and checking something. But we do want these names to be unique. All right? So, for example, if I was writing an application for community college and I was collaborating with someone from Tri-C, for example, I wouldn't want my classes to bump up against their classes. I don't, wouldn't want my package names to bump up against theirs. So they use a reverse sort of uh, notation for URLs. So, for example, in, in, the, in the one that we're going to look at today, um, you know, we are here at, and our domain name is lorraineccc.edu. So, our packages may start out with edu.lorraineccc. I'm working in the CISS division or department as opposed to the engineering division. So, maybe we'd do CISS. And I'm doing this as part of, say, my Java class as opposed to an advanced Java class or an Android development class or something like that. And I, may, and I then might have my GUI classes and I may have my um, other classes. In this case, I'm doing the famous centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion, you know. We'll teach those folks at Tri-C how to do that one, right? So I'm going to create two different packages that have these two things as their package names. And that should be a pretty safe assurance that, that no one is going to duplicate my, my uh, uh, package names, right? There should not be anywhere else on earth a LorraineCCC.edu, right? So no one should have this as the first two things of their uh, of their package names other than, than people that work at, at this institution. What's more, CISS means that, okay, I'm the only one, you know, uh, or we're the only folks with CISS. If engineering was doing some sort of development or some other division was doing development, they could have their initials in there. So all I would have to do is make sure I coordinate between the other CISS faculty and would be okay and we could guarantee that there are no package names with the same name. All right, so what does this mean? All right, we're going to keep this up here because these are, these are my two package names. All right, and let's look at the actual code and how I have it set up. I have, by the way, in Angel, under resource and examples, from deployment on down are a list of examples, um, or a list of, of resources that are going to be relevant over the next period of time. The deployment one is the one that we're looking at now. All right. So if we look at deployment, all right, notice that this folder we can forget. In fact, I'll drag it out of there. All right. Here is my working directory for this application. This would be considered my application root. All right. That deployment folder. Now, notice what I have. I have edu folder, Lorraine CCC folder inside the edu folder, CISS folder inside of that, Java inside of that, and then I have conversions which has my actual Java uh, class. And then I have GUI, which has my GUI class. Okay, so this, this folder path up here, you know, from the root on down actually corresponds to my packages. And so the GUI is in this package. My conversion is in this. You don't have to put it's just that I'm doing a very small example. I just have one class per package. I mean, ordinarily you'd have several classes in there because we'd have all sorts of GUIs and we'd do all sorts of 
you know, you have to wait for the advanced Java class to do uh, miles to kilometers, all right? But, but, you know, you'd have that in there as well. All right. So, now I want to compile this. And I want to compile this. Normally when we've compiled things, we have, we've put the code, we, we've worked all in one folder, right? So now we're moving away from working all in one folder. Now what I want to do is I want to compile and I want to put the classes someplace else. All right? So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go and I'm going to compile it. I'm going to create a folder called classes that's going to have my compiled code in it. All right? So let me go and, and do that. All right? So let me get to the command line. All right, um, here I am effectively in the application route. All right, so what I want to do is I want to compile this and I want to make my, make a classes folder to put the stuff in. I don't want to put the, the compiled code in the same folder as the other stuff because when I make my archive, I don't want to include the source code and so on and so forth. So. I'm going to add a switch to the, the Java command statement. Um, you all familiar with what a switch is? A switch is essentially an option on a command line uh, uh, code. All right. I'm trying to think if we've seen any this semester. We really haven't. But the one I'm going to add is, is this. I'm going to compile and I'm going to say instead of my normal compile, which is just Java C, I'm going to specify Java C dash D and I'm going to give a directory path or a directory that I want to start putting my classes in, my class files, my compiled code. That directory has to exist, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to make that directory first. But I'm going to go in and create that. Then I put in the name of the files that I want to compile. All right. But first, I forgot to show you how we indicate in each of these Java classes that they belong in this package, right? Because originally, when everything's all in one folder, it's easy to find stuff, right? It's either, you either, it's either part of the Java basic language, all right, or you import the package that it's in, or you fully qualify the, the class name. Um, we're going to do a similar thing here, all right? So let's open up this first GUI class. And again, let me open it with WordPad and save it. I'll do the same thing for the other one, just to get that out of the way. First of all, I indicate at the top with the, command, with, the, with the line package what package this thing is in. So this is in the package edu, Lorraine CCC, CISS, Java, GUI. So I've identified what package this belongs in. I did the same thing on my other class in conversions, my temperature Java. I indicate at the very top Package is edu, Lorraine CCC, CISS, Java conversions. All right. So I put that just right at the top of both of them to identify what packages these get put in. I then, in my first GUI, because my first GUI has code which references that class, so I do just like what I've done with any class that's not in the same package. I uh, import it. So I import edu, Lorraine CCC, blah, 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 dot temperature. All right. All this is, by the way, is a little GUI that pops up a, a label and asks the user to enter in a temperature with a button. And when they click the button, um, it creates one of these temperature objects, does the conversion, and displays the result and displays if there's an exception. 
but we'll see how it works later. The point is, is this guy, which is in the GUI package, uses this other class, which is in the conversion class. I'm sorry, conversion package. All right, so we've identified what package each our two classes are in. Um, and we have uh, done the appropriate import so the classes can find each other. So let's, let's rewind for a second. Let, let's sum up where, where, we have, uh, where we've gotten to at this point. Where we've gotten to is the first thing that we've done is we've made a directory structure that matches We've made a directory structure that matches our package structure. In other words, from our application root, we have edu, going ccc, and so on down the line. So we made those folders that match our package structure. We then go and put our Java source code. In other words, this, this, was, a co this was code that I already had that worked. I went and I put them in the appropriate folders and I've identified what package they belong in, and then I use the appropriate import so the, pack, or so the classes can find each other. All right? So now we are ready to compile this. All right? So what I'm going to do is from the command line, all right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a classes directory. So I just made that directory. Now, Java C, I include the D switch for classes. What that means is that's where I want to put the compiled code, all right, in the classes directory that I just made. All right. And then I specify the path to sort of the main, just like I did before. In, in the past, like you would compile your uh, test code. Well, I'm going to compile that, but now it's not in this folder, so I'm going to specify the path. And that path is edu slash um, Lorraine CCC slash CISS slash Java slash GUI slash first GUI dot Java. So the only two differences in this and what we've been doing before is that, let me, let me do this. Let me go and paste that into Word or something so that we can look at this um, all, uh, all on one line. Let me get rid of the prompt first of all. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. All right. Java, da Java C, we've done that before. Dash D classes, what that is, is the dash D says don't put the sort, or I'm sorry, don't put the compiled classes where they normally would go, put them in this directory. And that's the classes directory that I just made. And what do I want to compile? Well, remember, I'm in the root of the application, so I put the path to that Java class I want to compile. The path to it will be, again, the folder structure on down, edu, Lorraine, ccc, and so on. All right? So now I'm ready to go and compile it. It does its thing. And it's done. Now, let's look at where the classes got put.
if you notice, what it did is it created all the layers in my package all the way down. So you notice I'm going to use Windows Explorer for this. In my classes folder, there now is an EDU folder. Originally it was empty, all right? Inside that there's a Lorraine CCC folder. Inside that there's a CISS folder. Inside that there's a Java folder. Inside that there's a conversion and GUI folder. And inside that are those class files that I just compiled. So now I have the class files in a separate place than the, um, than the source code, which is a good thing, right? Because anything I do here, I don't want to involve the source code at all. I want to take and package up this, um, um, this compiled code. Questions about that? All right. Now, I have my code in those classes. Now I want to go and I want to combine that to make a jar file. All right. So I'm going to go into that classes folder and I'm going to add a file to this which is called the manifest file. Alright, there's the manifest file. I had this from when I did this earlier. I'm essentially recreating steps that I did a while ago. What's in that manifest file? If we look in here, let's go. It gives the path of where the class that has the main method that when I execute this jar, whose main method do I want? Remember, there could potentially be several different uh, classes that have main methods. All right? Um, I have to tell it which one I want when I execute the jar. So I have main class colon, and then I have the path to that class. You know, all the packages on down, edu, Lorraine CCC, blah, 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 dot first GUI, that's the class that has the main method that I want to call when I go and do this. All right? I do think you have to put, I, I, I seem to recall, and this, this might be just bad memory or whatever, I, I do think you have to put a, a carriage return after the last the last uh, thing of the line. I remember like leaving that out and it seemed to cause me grief. This could be a bad memory on my part, but you know, you know, you could, you could try that out. So now I have my manifest file and my classes and I can create my jar. All right. How do I create my jar? I get into the folder where the classes are and again, I'm going to go in the Word and type in the command, and then I'll paste it in here. Hopefully with no spell correct on Word's part. All right, there's the instruction. Jar says to make a jar, all right? Or let me rephrase that. Jar says that I want to do something with the jar, all right? I want to do a jar-related activity, all right? Dash C is the switch that indicates I want to create the jar. Dash V means I want to verify it. In other words, I want to see some feedback from it. 
The M means something that I do not know. <laughs> All right, we'll look it up in a second. The F means get the manifest information from the file. Maybe the M and the F go together to say manifest file. I don't know. But I definitely know the F means, that the F refers to the fact that the manifest information is in this file. Let's Google this real quick to make sure. You know, I'm so used to using the Chrome browser where you just type in the address line your search. Um, doesn't work like that in all browsers. Jar command switches. Yeah, okay. C uh, is to create, V probably stands for verbose, not verify. And MF means manifest from a file, I believe. Command line arguments. Yeah, shoot. Options. Yeah, okay, C means create. V means verbose, gives you more output. F means, oh, F is the file, the jar file that I want to create. M stands for manifest. Okay. All right. So, let's go and run this. It does not like something with my cutting and pasting didn't go good. So let me go and retype it. Jar dash CVMF manifest.txt edu. File not found exception. Yes, indeed. I forgot to do the jar file. Um, what I call it, conv.jar edu. Thank you. All right. There it goes. It's doing its thing. It's telling us what it's doing. All right. And when I'm done, I now have my jar file. All right. Which I should be able to take and put anywhere and run it. Let's go in. Let's copy that somewhere else. Let's just copy it to this folder. should be able to just double click it and it will fire up. And sure enough it does. Temperature in centigrade, um, 22 is 71 Fahrenheit. Um, I put garbage in, I get my exception. All right. So this contains like everything from all the classes and the classes know how to talk to each other and know the packages and all that. So I have my jar. I can also run it from a command line, you know, double clicking works. I can also run it from a command line by saying, let me copy it back. Oh, that's not the right folder. That was my old one. Okay. I can also go from the command line and say,
Java dash jar to indicate that I'm, I'm not executing a class, I'm executing a jar file. And that works as well. All right. Now you have a jar file. You have everything that you need in one Java archive file. What you do then really depends on the platform. And, and there's, there's applications that you can use that can take and make a, an install program and all that. So you could put your little install program on that. The jar file, by the way, is key to deployment of this application, whether you're talking about uh, deploying it to the client or even some of the other solutions. Uh, when we talk about the Java applet, you need a jar file. So making this jar is like a good thing, all right, uh, to do. Questions at this point? All right. So that creates a jar file. To summarize what we did, we made folders that match our package structure and we used sort of the reverse domain notation to, to come up with the name of our packages. We put the classes in their appropriate packages and we indicated with the first line what package they live in. We then used the import command to import so the classes could find each other. We compiled and created our classes out in another place, in another folder using the um, using the um, slash D uh, switch to create or to to update a folder with with the uh, with the classes we then created a manifest that says where the uh, file with the main is what the main method is then we executed the Java uh, 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 or the jar command to create the jar uh, again there are other jar commands that you can do if you do a jar dash xf I don't know what that did jar dot x f yeah that's good because there's nothing to see <laughs> The, the dash tf, uh, if, I execute, if I execute jar dash tf conv jar, it shows me like what's in the jar, all the, all the, the classes and so on. I also have dash xf jar, and I'm not really sure what that does. Um, do I still have that browser window open? No, I don't. Where is it sending me? That's Los Angeles. Jar. CBS Television City. Maybe it knows something I don't. Welcome to Jar, the modern shop house in the heart. Who would have thought? Let's try to be a little more precise here. Command options. There you go. T lists the table of contents. What was the other one I said? X. X extracts. Okay. Extracts the files. I guess it really doesn't matter. Actually, what it, it looks like what it did is it looks like it created these files to tell me that there's a manifest. I'll bet you if I got rid of these,
and extract it again. Yeah, it went and re it looks like it recreated it. It's not letting me delete that one for some reason, but uh, it says to re uh, that it uh, extracts it. Anyhow, um, okay, so that's it on creating jars. N uh, jars are useful again in, in doing a couple of the mixes between client and server. And what we're going to talk about next are some of the solutions that are between the client and server where, where it's mixed. And the first one we're going to talk about is a Java applet. Can anyone define what a Java applet is? Can anyone give a nice little concise definition of what a Java applet is? Okay. Standalone program? Mm. It is a program. I'm not sure about the standalone part of it. Let me ask you this. Where does an applet run? Okay. That's true. It, it is executed by the Java virtual machine. That's true. Let me ask you this. Can I run it from the command line? All right. Actually, a Java applet is a little code, is a little program, a little Java program that runs inside a browser. So applets run inside web browsers as opposed to like we've been doing this from the command line. Let's see, let's Google uh, an example of one. Plus I have one of my own. Where you have likely seen Java applets are um, a lot of chat, uh, online chats are, are done via Java applets. Um, a lot of um, code to say, like, I think like I, I upload photos to Walgreen and have them printed. I think that's done with a Java applet. So again, it's a little more beefy functionality than a typical web page, all right? Um, I think Flickr uses a Java applet. Anyhow, here's a Rubik's Cube. Java applet. Let's fire it up. Notice immediately when I go in here that that little message popped up. It fired off the Java virtual machine. So I can scramble it and now I can try see how do you move this? Click a face. Oh. I can move that around. Clearly, you know, that's not your standard garden variety HTML, right? That's application E, all right? Um, if you see something like this, there's probably three main options of what it could be. Three, if, if you didn't know this is a Java applet, there'd be three possibilities. It could be a Java applet, it could be something done in Flash, it might be something done in Ajax, um, maybe an HTML5 thing, so maybe four options. This happens to be a Java applet. So it has program level functionality built embedded into a, a web page. All right. Now, both the client and the server play a role in this, right? Because the server is where the applet lives but the applet runs on my client machine on the browser. So therefore, if I go and access this page, there's, there's a copy of the applet on the server that gets sent to my client machine as well as anyone else that's doing this, their client machine, and then it runs on my machine. So other than the initial load of the applet, I'm not bugging the server unless I um, well, in this application, there's nothing like a save or anything, but uh, I'm not bugging the server at all. It downloads it, and then it's done with it. 
All right, the server's done with it. Yet it does solve some of the deployment issues. In other words, if there was a bug in this Rubik's Cube, all right, they wouldn't have to fix it on everyone's machine that downloaded it. They would just change the applet the next time someone visited that page to get the refreshed applet. So this solves some of the deployment issues with this. And again, it's nice because it's embedded in the browser, and most people have browser. Um, it does require that the user has a Java virtual machine installed. Because if you do not have the Java virtual machine installed, you won't be able to run this. Because this code runs on your machine. All right. If I draw my famous diagram for this, it would look something like this. Client. Server. Actually, that's the internet, not the server. Client makes a request. The server delivers a web page plus the applet. Comes back as an HTML page plus the applet code, which is in the form of a jar file. All right, so the client is getting a jar file. From that point on, the browser uses the Java virtual machine to run that applet code. All right. I suppose, again, it, it, you know, in most cases, the server, once it delivers it, it's done with it. I suppose there could be some cases where if you wanted to save something, maybe there'd be a mechanism by which you'd send that to the server to be saved. But uh, typically, once you down, uh, applets usually aren't used for that sort of functionality. You know, um, you know, small games like this, chat programs, maybe an upload file. I guess would be a case of something where you're sending it to the server. All right, let's look at my example. And again, this is an angel under resources examples, applet example. Actually, I stand corrected. It doesn't need a jar. I was thinking of the Java web start needed a jar file. An applet doesn't need a jar. The Java web start, I think, needs a jar, if my memory serves. All right, so let's go. And I have the Java source code, but all I really need is the class file. So I double click this and start it off. Ah, it's warning me uh, that it, it can't do this because of permissions. I'm going to go and. Allow that. Then I have to restart the browser. Oh, it failed. Let me try IE. There are security issues, with, uh, or uh, the browsers have protection to let you know that you're running a Java applet, which is kind of odd because um, there's a lot of security built into applets where, for example, it's not allowed to write anything to the client machine. Now, that being said, there have been exploits of exploiting bugs in Java to allow some malicious code to happen in this. Uh, but at any rate, um, I'm going to allow the block content. All right, and there we go. And here's my Java application, the very same one that I was looking at, we were looking at before, that's running in my web browser. Invalid input, and so on. Now, how do you make this happen? You make this happen two ways. You convert 
your code to an applet. All right. Um, how do you do that? It's very simple. It's a matter of implementing an interface, I believe, and uh, adding a few methods. And then you build an HTML document in which you embed the applet. We'll very briefly preview that, and this is we'll, this will be our starting point next uh, next week. Um, as far as the application goes, all right. I, already, I see I misspoke. Instead of extend, instead of impl it's not an interface. It's actually a superclass. So you extend. Instead of extending JFrame, you extend JApplet. And notice now you do not have a main method, you have an init method. There's a set of methods that, that you have available to you in the applet, and you need at least a few of them, right? But you're not going to have a main method, you're going to have an init method. So by and large, the only thing I did for this one, all right, is to change the inheritance of this to inherit it to to be um, to be um, inherited from uh, an applet rather than inherited from the JFrame, and then I went and uh, changed the main event to an init uh, or main function to an init. I also got rid of this because that's no longer valid because that's uh, something that exists on the JFrame. All right. So that's all I had to do for that. As far as the HTML goes, all I did was I put in an applet tag that says where the code is from. I believe you can put either a class or a jar there. All right. I specified how big I want to make it. And then I have this code. If for some reason that applet can't load because of browser settings or whatever, it gives you that message. That's the mess security message we were getting initially saying your browser doesn't support the applet tag. All right. So this is another way of deploying your Java application, you know, putting it in, embedded in there. Now there are some restrictions about applets. I, I implied some of them, not being able to access client resources. And those are good things, right? You wouldn't want these to be you know, running amok on your machine. All right. Um, and again, the browser typically has a layer to, to let you know at least and, and warn you before, uh, before you run those things. We'll talk more about applets next time, and we, we may even try to convert um, a Java application to an applet. All right? See you up in lab.